Hello, I'm Professor Russell Goldborn. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, on which I live and work, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Over these past few months, as we've come to terms with living under uh, COVID-19, I've had a number of conversations with colleagues in my faculty, and those conversations have reminded me just how important the humanities and social sciences are, the extent to which they can help us to understand the challenges that we're facing at the moment. And I'm really keen to share some of the insights uh, from those conversations. So today I've invited my colleague, Associate Professor Leah Rapana, uh, to join me uh, to discuss the impact that the pandemic is having on the working lives of women in our society. Leah is an Associate Professor of Sociology in the School of Social and Political Sciences in the Faculty of Arts. She is co-director of the Policy Lab and an expert in family, gender and public policy. Leah, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you. Now, look, I know that much of your research is on women's work and on women's unpaid work in the domestic sphere in particular. I'd be really interested to hear from you what COVID-19 means for women generally and for the future of their working lives. So COVID-19 has laid bare a, a really a care crisis that has been building for decades. So I have been talking for 15 or 20 years about the fact that women are carrying the unpaid domestic burden, that it's at the expense of their health, it's at the expense of their work lives, it's at the expense of their leisure, that this is really, really an important thing and it's draining on women. What I anticipated happening was that the the care crisis would you know, become unmasked or become so unbearable once the baby boomers retired, once the fact that you have um, the aging population, women absorbing the care of you know, parents, relatives, et cetera, that then we would see that this is unsustainable and the government would have to intervene and help women. But what I didn't anticipate was that overnight COVID-19 would, would just illuminate this unequal, the consequences of the unequal distribution of care work. What happened overnight was schools closed, child cares closed, and all that unpaid work came into the home. So we anticipated that this was being carried by women and that it would be carried at the expense of their health and well-being. But, you know, we're scientists and we want to actually bring some empirics to this. So we collected some data, my, um, the policy lab, along with the U.S. Study Center at University of Sydney, Media and, and Politics at La Trobe University, and we asked a thousand um, Australians and a thousand Americans what was happening with their unpaid work under COVID-19. And what we could see was that men were doing more, yes, men are contributing a larger share, but women are much more likely to say that they're doing much, much more. And if we think about what care looked like before, women were always doing two times the amount of unpaid childcare and housework before the crisis. So if they're taking on even more work under COVID, it means they're doubling that again. Lynn Craig and Brendan Churchill and our sociology group have collected time use data. They're finding that actually that's true, that unpaid work is again doubling and women are doing more share. We also asked what was happening for people's health. And we found that women are reporting that they can't sleep, their sleep is more restless, they very rarely feel calm, and they're feeling more anxious under this. So they're taking on that burden at the expense of their health. In addition to that, women are incredibly worried about their economic futures. They're worried they're not gonna have enough money to, retirement on, to retire on. That came through our study as well. And they're also more likely to say that they've lost their job. And the challenge is, is that as this care crisis continues, as the effect of COVID turn into an economic recession, right, that women's jobs are gonna be slow to recover because they're disproportionately in, you know, things like tourism and the service industry. I'm not talking about the nurses, right? But, but it took a care crisis to say, you know, these nurses actually need childcare because their work is valuable. That's pretty outrageous. But I'm talking about these industries that are gonna take a long time to recover. And so as women look forward, I don't see a rosy picture. I think that if governments are developing lifelines, because this is the moment where they're gonna start throwing 
lifelines out to stimulate the economy. We need to value care work and we need to throw lifelines not just to manufacturing, not just to kind of these construction, but we need to throw them to these jobs that women are disproportionately in. We need to give them access to resources to reskill because that's what they're going to need to do. And all of that means that their care work needs to be valued and needs to be supported. So as you say, it raises really important uh, policy questions that uh, I hope we'll have time to come back to in, in a moment. But the other thing that really strikes me in what you're saying is just the extent to which this uh, pandemic has, has highlighted and, and exacerbated existing or pre-existing uh, inequalities and, and problems that were kind of bubbling up, as you were saying, that, that care crisis that was, was building up and has really brought this to, to a head. Um, I'm really interested to hear in particular about that, the, the data that you found and perhaps say a little bit more about um, that, the survey that you did. And in particular, if there are, I know you said you were um, getting respondents both from the, the States and Australia. Um, I wonder if there are particular trends coming through that data um, about Australia specifically, or, or are you finding that the two nations are on similar trajectories in, in this question? So the US and Australia are, of course, always different and they're different in, in very meaningful ways. Some of the work we've been doing through this is around um, trust in media, trust in experts, you know, who are people turning to in these times of crisis? And this is coming through Andrea Carson's work at Latrobe. She's very a media expert, right? And one of the, we got some press, you know, this has been covered in the age. We've been getting a lot of media coverage on this. And one of the interesting things around that is that um, there is a return to trusted sources. There's a return to experts, which is actually really important for us because we think we're very important, right? <laughs> but sometimes that gets lost in the hustle and the bustle of what it is to be an academic academic expert. But in times like this, people really do want real, true, and reliable information. One. However, how this is being viewed is through a partisan lens, but only in the U.S., which is, of course, not, perhaps not surprising, that if you do weaponize your press and say that everything is fake news, when you have a moment of crisis that people actually don't trust, you know, that we're finding the Republicans are less likely to trust the news, they're not turning to reliable sources. One of the interesting things we asked too, on, on more kind of my area of research, we asked people how much support do they have for free universal childcare for everyone? And the reason we asked this question is because for the first time in, in Australian history, right, the government extended free childcare to everyone. You know, they, they, they subsidized it, they paid for it. And the US, like the UK, like Australia, um, tends to only give this type of benefit to those in greatest need. It's this kind of um, liberal welfare state, right? That is the approach, which is very, very different from a country like Sweden. So I was interested in what, what's happening to that. The minute you throw everyone into the home and you show that childcare is not just this kind of um, luxury, childcare is not a luxury for families, it actually is a necessity for mothers to work. Do people shift in their attitudes? And one of the interesting things we found was that actually, if you look amongst, and we're interested in the partisan divide, right? Because this often gets framed around, you know, quote unquote, liberal agenda versus the conservative agenda, which is very interesting because we don't necessarily talk about public schools in the same way. But child care centers function much like a public school. They're giving high quality care to children to close educational gaps. And so what we found was actually the partisan divide between conservative men and women had disappeared. Basically, conservative women were just as likely as uh, left-leaning women in Australia to say that, yeah, we should support this for everyone. But when we looked across the entire sample of Australians, we didn't see strong hostility. Only 25% men, women, everyone disagreed with this idea, which when you think about it, this is quite radical, right? We're saying we should give it to all Australian citizens. The only other thing I want to say on this point is for Australia in particular, that, you know, there's kind of this argument that, well, you know, if we give people childcare, it's just a windfall to the rich family. Groton Institute produced a report in which they showed that actually the way in which the tax structure is in Australia it decentivizes those at the higher ends of the tax income from, from working five days a week, basically, because the childcare costs and the tax structure is such that you end up paying more money than you actually get back. So as we think about ways to throw lifelines to families, 
One argument is keep this childcare thing, make sure that the childcare workers are paid appropriately, but, but actually have the government absorb this. This is important because it's gonna allow mothers to look for new jobs, to reskill into new industries. We're doing some work on AI, what AI means for the future of women in work, and I would not be surprised if this gets accelerated under the pandemic. And so women are gonna need you know, new skills to be able to fit into the new workforce that may happen more quickly. But also, even if people get, you know, have additional money, they're gonna put it back into the economy. So you're looking for ways to stimulate spending. Giving parents childcare is a double whammy and it's effective in terms of cost. They're gonna probably work, you're gonna put money back into the economy, so you're gonna get taxes in those two ways. And if the care is assumed, then you are able to, um, then women are able to engage in, reskilling in ways that they couldn't if their kids were home with them all day long all day long no absolutely and that uh, that personal experience resonates with me as well i can uh, assure you but so it's it's interesting that we you know on the one hand we were saying that this pandemic is kind of re-highlighting um the way things have been and a kind of status quo but at the same time there's an opportunity here by the sounds of it that for us to do things quite differently you know what you've just been talking about signals some really interesting cultural shifts you know that as you're saying that return to trusting in experts but also a, a, quite a significant shift in attitudes it seems to me around social policy and yeah i'd be interested to hear what how you think how you think what we need to do to take some of that policy change forward like, i guess that potentially there's a risk that we do just as we emerge from this pandemic as we emerge out of lockdown that we will just shift back precisely to the status quo. So how do we keep that, that momentum going if there are these arguments in favour of significant social policy change? How do, we, how, how, do you, how do you think we make that happen? What are the arguments in favour of, of keeping that going? I think one of, this is um, both a terrible event, but also an incredible opportunity. I think if we go back to normal, if we go back to what we call quote unquote normal lives, that what we are gonna do, there is real serious potential to wipe out 50 years of gender progress. The reason I say that is because what normal looks like in Australia are long hours, long work hours, 50 hour work weeks, right? And if you have, um, if you, we know that women are disproportionately affected by this, if we know that female dominated industries are gonna be slow to recover, if we know that actually as companies are moving, opening up, that they're thinking about austerity, they're thinking about the bottom line, they're thinking about maximizing output, that there is a risk that what we do is we continue with these incredibly long work hours, some of the longest work hours out of all of the OECD nations, and that that is going to make it very, very difficult for women to step back in the labor market. Right? Because one of the challenges, is I, I, don't, I don't think men are saying this is great for them either. I'm talking about women, but what what the research shows is that you have a group of young men who want to be equal carers, they want to be equal sharers, they're more egalitarian in their ideology, like they want to step in. But the challenge is how do you step in when you're working 50 hours a week? And that's what the Hilda report is showing, that if you look at total time, men and women are spending huge amounts of time in unpaid and paid work. Men are disproportionately skewed towards paid work, Women are taking on a lot more of the unpaid work, but there isn't a lot of extra time for people or extra capacity. So as we move forward, if we do not actually make care a central priority, one that we understand that it needs to be valued, that it needs to have institutional policies to support it, not just putting in a document, you know, we care about caregivers, right? Where are the policies? Where are the policies to count that work? Where are the policies to ensure that actually people can take flexible time, reduce their work time without penalty? How do we know that, how do we role model for men that they can do that? They can step back from their careers without consequence. You know, they're worried, they wanna do it, but they think they're gonna get knocked out of the labor market. They think they're gonna get passed up for their promotions. And if they are the breadwinner, right? If they are the only person bringing in the income, and this is going to get worse with COVID, right? Then why in the world would they step out of employment? So this is not a gender war story. This is not a men versus women story. 
this is about the lack of effective policy and we have countries from around the world that have shown us the way shown that this increases productivity, shown that it increases GDP. So why are we not looking to these countries for our value? Hey, hello. I'm, I'm being requested for math homework out. This is like... <laughs> this is the reality. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be with you in 20 minutes. They're listening to the video. This is it. Women are doing this care work, right? We're the primary carers, we're the primary breadwinners. Even when you're working full time, it's additive. And if we don't actually have policies, I mean, I'm talking about not just lip service, but legitimate, real policies that actually account for the care. We can't do no. it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And really interesting that, as you say, this is a, an issue both for men and for, for women. And I was wondering the, the extent to which, going back to the survey that you've done, the data that you've got, the extent to which that, um, that point is reflected in the, in the feedback that you get. You know, do, do men see this particular uh, issue that we're, or this situation that we're going through, do, do men see it in the same way as women? What, are there, or are there differences in their, their own perception of how much they're contributing to the, to the home? The New York Times just ran a piece, and it was data collected by my colleague, sociologist, in the US. And, and I'll talk first about the US data and then I'll show you a little bit about what we found in Australia. So they asked people, they asked people, wow, what share of this? Partners, couples, right? So they took couples and then they took full-time working couples and then they took full-time working couples with kids. And they asked the partners, how much are you sharing? Like how much are you doing with the housework, childcare, the new schooling, and how much is your partner doing? And one of the things that made the headline was that actually Partners are in disagreement about how much each other is doing. This is something that's been shown across a whole range of housework literature. Basically, and when they ask people about housework, everyone lies a little bit, they overestimate, but men overestimate more than do women. From this New York Times data, which comes from data in the US asking about these divisions of labor, what they found was that men were reporting they were doing significantly more than what the women were reporting the men do. So, you know, mothers were saying they were doing 80%, you know, they were respons mostly responsible for the housework 80%, and maybe men were saying 20%. And that actually men were much more likely to say they were doing more, they were much more likely to say they were equal sharers. We have a paper, it was Swedish data, where we looked at this mismatch in reporting. And one of the interesting things we found, and let's say Sweden's like our most egalitarian country, right? Like, let's take it as like, hey, this is the country where we all want to aspire to be. So for these data, what we found was this mismatch when, when men and women report different amounts, meaning the men say they're doing more and the women say the women are doing more. So there's some sort of discrepancy in their report. Women are much more likely to think about breaking up with that man. And we followed them over time and they did actually, those relationships were more likely to dissolve. So one of the challenges is at this moment in time, yes, people are doing more and our data from Australia is showing, yes, men are doing more. They're doing more than they did before. But what men perceive to be more versus what the women are perceiving is different. And this goes back to kind of the gender roles, who's responsible for what, what's the standard, where's the mental load fitting into this, you know. Um, Again, I'm not, I, I hate to fall into gender wars, right? This is not a gender war, but what it's showing is that women are feeling, at a minimum, they're feeling like they're caring more. And what we're showing is their health is suffering more than that. We had um, three in five men reporting that they're calm almost all the time under COVID-19. Like I'm going insane. My mental health is on like the deep slide. So I, I you know, whether this is about toxic masculinity or this idea that under hardship men, you know, men never are affected, that's a whole nother debate. But, but the empirical evidence is clear that women are feeling like they're doing more and their health is suffering as a result of that. Yeah, and that health issue is, is a really serious one, as, as you say. Um, interesting you mentioned uh, Sweden then, and, and a few moments ago you talked about other countries that, that show us the way here. Um, what, which are those countries? If Australia is to look at examples of uh, really good interventions that could be made to uh, address these kind of issues, what, what sort of examples should we be looking at? Which countries should we be turning to? 
So um, I know everyone's going to hate me saying the Scandinavian model. Um, so I think there's a couple of things, right? The good news is that Scandinavia has been talking about these issues for 20, 30 years. They've been introducing interventions. They've been testing the interventions. So if we want to look kind of the longest term, you know, looking to a country like Sweden, where, you know, they have instituted parental leave that actually is a use it or lose it. The men have to take it or else the family loses it. This was something that was really, really essential to getting men's uptake in this. Um, the other thing, I have colleagues there that then found following these men over time, that men having that bonding period with their children, the result of that was the kids were more likely to go to the fathers when they were hurt. Equally as likely, right? That's quite important and meaningful for a parent. And that also men did more housework over the long term, following them over time. That maybe that reset within the home helped kind of identify the true volume of the work. Um, well, there is an argument that COVID-19 might do the same in that people can, men are now seeing uh, the huge amount of work that's happening. This has been featured in The Age with some of our researchers here. Also Lynn Craig and Brendan Churchill got featured in their work around these kinds of arguments. But if people hate the idea of Scandinavia, I know it's like a bit hard to be always told, like all we have to do is just be Scandinavia. Then let me give another country. Can we just be like New Zealand? Because actually their prime minister is coming out now and saying, why don't we take this exactly like you said earlier? Why don't we take this as an opportunity to restock? Why don't we look into a four day work week? And the reason she's saying that is not only because it's better for productivity, it's better for kind of connection to your your business, but it also is better for equalizing gender relations within the home. So if we don't want to be Sweden because we're sick of being told that we have to be a Nordic country, could we please just try to be a bit more like New Zealand? It sounds like a good model to me. So, so perhaps, and this might be a way for us to wrap up, what if we were to have this conversation in 12 months time, and think, well, you know, have we, have we followed those examples? Have we done the kind of things that we, we should have done? And what will be the real signs that we have actually used this as an opportunity to address some really serious social and, and, and public health issues? What will you be looking out for? Um, I would, there are a couple of things. One, I, I would be on like the top of my list would be to keep the childcare credit because it's already been done. Don't strip it away, right? That's number one. Um, number two is that I want care to be brought back from kind of from the recesses in which it was, right? Like kind of an afterthought of like, oh yeah, people, we know people are doing that. And oh yeah, that must be, oh yeah, that must be hard to actually bringing it forward and, and treating it like a public health crisis, a public health issue. Um, I'd also like to see that the government, and this is where governments have to step in. I mean, you and I cannot do it. Government and organizations, perhaps. I would like to see careful attention being paid to the ways in which women's jobs are being knocked out, women's superannuations are being knocked out, um, women's incomes are being knocked out, to use that as kind of an orienting concept. And like I said earlier, I want lifelines to go to female-dominated industries. I don't want to just have government saying, well, now we need to make sure that the construction is going again, and the manufacturing and the mining, three kind of male-dominated industries. That's that's important, but we also need to make sure that the money and the support and the innovation is happening in those three industries. I also think there's actually a real opportunity, a win-win for, or for companies, organizations, um, to use this as an opportunity to restock kind of existing ways in which we work that were established 50 years ago under very different models in which people have a breadwinner and a homemaker and everyone has to be in the office. And I think we've shown that this is not actually necessary. And so thinking through that component, and I want within institutions like Melbourne Uni, caregiving to actually be not just a line in, in policy, but actually have teeth behind it, have you know, legitimate kind of institutional supports around it. Yes, it's important, and how are we supporting it? Because the truth is, I'm talking about my moment in time with you know, kids here interrupting at all hours of the day, but caregiving doesn't end when kids you know, enter school or are 18, people are carrying very different caregiving demands, even if they're not parents or, this is not an issue for mothers, this is an issue that transcends actually the life course. And so we need to account for that, that caregiving is a part of our experience of being a human. So that makes a lot of sense. And that sense that the, 
you know, the, the responsibility uh, falls on individuals, but on organizations, companies, industries, government too. Um, and I think that's why your work that you're doing through the policy lab, through the research that you've talked about today as well, is so important in bringing that analytical lens to this, the, the empirical data that you've got, um, and just yeah, enabling us to, to seize this opportunity and to make a difference in, in our society. I've really enjoyed having this conversation about um, the implications for, for family lives, for care, the implications of this pandemic that we're living through, because it, it speaks very deeply to my own experience as well. Uh, you know, my, my wife and I, with our two young boys, who are now six and two, um, you know, we've been living through these, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the need to, to change our respective uh, roles and responsibilities that we've had to take on more. I've had to take on more care responsibility, uh, but in particular, my, my wife has had to uh, step back from some of her paid work in order to do more of this unpaid work in, in the home. So, so I can see from, from personal experience what this means in, in practical terms. I can see what it means when uh, the schools have been closed, but we've had different kinds of access to childcare um, and the, the, the practical effects that that has had on our day-to-day -day lives. So, so it's really helpful for me to, to think through those issues that we've been facing as a family, but to think those through more broadly in the context of, of big shifts that are happening in, in Australian society, but in other societies too. One of the things I've enjoyed about this conversation is hearing the perspectives that you've got from, from other nations as well, from, from the States, uh, from Scandinavia, as you say, and, and from New Zealand. So just to see it in that broader context too is, is really helpful. Thank you so much. I've learned so much from this conversation. Uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing, and it's uh, great to talk to you today. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thanks for including me.